My name is Joe Lombardo, and I am the coordinator of UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition, who is hosting the webinar today. Um, the webinar is really going to be a documentary film showing and discussion of the film. And we're really fortunate to have two people to aid in that discussion. One is um, Lee Soo Hin, who is the producer of the film um, and the writer of the film, um, along with Sarah Flounders, who um, produced the two books that this video is based upon. Um, the books were also aided and put together by members of the Sanction Skill Campaign, which is a group of people from many organizations who have opposed the illegal unilateral sanctions that the US has imposed on over 40 countries representing more than one third of the world's population. We in the Sanctions Kill Campaign view sanctions as a form of economic warfare that has been responsible for millions of deaths around the world. Um, the documentary is based on these two books. One is called um, Sanctions, a Wrecking Ball of the Global Economy, and the other one is called Capitalism on a Ventilator. And they deal with the question of sanctions and the questions of sanctions in light of the COVID epidemic and the role the US played in denying um, vaccines to countries that were um, sanctioned. So we're gonna start the film in a few minutes, but first I'm gonna introduce Sarah Flounders, who is the co-coordinator of the International Action Coalition and a member of the UNAC Administrative Committee. She is the leader of the Workers' World Party and she is the author of many books and articles over many years of activism. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Sarah. Let me just mention that when the film starts, I will turn off the um, uh, chat. You can put questions in the question and answer um, uh, area, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And the reason I'm gonna turn off the chat because uh, um, it, often what will happen was when someone puts something in the chat, it will cover over the screen and we don't want to do that. So people will be able to view the uh, video. So um, for the viewing of the video, we'll, we'll turn off the chat during that period. Now, let me again introduce uh, Sarah Flounders. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, and it's an honor to be participating in today's documentary. Uh, vaccine and sanctions. I'm, I'm doing so and, and speaking as part of the Sanctions Kill campaign, which is really a collaboration of quite a number of organizations, solidarity groups, and activists who uh, had been focusing on the impact of U.S. sanctions on different countries around the world and really came together to explain sanctions as a devastating weapon meant to strangle the economy of all different countries that literally were just expressing their sovereignty, attempting to develop their economy. It doesn't take much to be sanctioned by the US. There are now 40 countries, a third of the world population uh, under US and sanctions. EU sanctions uh, and UN sanctions. And for whatever country it is, it has a really an impact on every aspect of life, but especially, especially is criminal, is deadly for the older, the sick, and the youth. So the Sanctions Kill campaign was focused on producing meetings, actions, webinars international petitions with thousands of signers, organizing teaching tools, uh, PowerPoint presentations, and then gathering all this material into the book, Sanctions, a Wrecking Ball in a Global Economy. Uh, we produced special reports that went to Congress and the United Nations, 
uh, in all of this, uh, the, the cooperation of Lee Soo Hin, who's an activist I've known for many years uh, in terms of migrant rights as a Pacifica reporter. And uh, he uh, founded, coordinated the uh, China-US Solidarity Network, uh, really building cooperation uh, and exchange trips and so on with China, uh, involving US activists who are, are seeking to understand, explain, and defend uh, China against the unrelenting propaganda. Uh, I had an opportunity just before the pandemic to, to visit China with uh, Li Su Hin, and it was really an incredible experience. Uh, so, so much has changed since then. The US has stepped up uh, in the harshest ways, the attack on China, which are every day unrelenting uh, as China's economy has grown and is now surpassing the US in gross domestic product. But also China is a larger trading partner than the US with 120 countries around the world. That this is very threatening to US power to its global domination. Uh, and we need to look at the propaganda uh, that is so harsh and understand where it's coming from, corporate power in the US. So I think that uh, Lee Su Hin is doing a great deal to help explain this. Uh, and, and in China, he made this, um, this very interesting documentary explaining the sanctions uh, and explaining uh, the, the impact of withholding vaccines around the world from every one of the 40 sanctioned countries. And then what the impact of China's trade uh, and exchange and, and providing sanctions for millions and millions of people around the world. So the contrast of the two countries, you could never see clearer than during this pandemic. Uh, and that's why it's called vaccine and sanctions. It's really in two parts, and we're going to break halfway through it for a few minutes discussion. The first part dealing really with what we call vaccine imperialism, the way vaccines were withheld, doled out in meager uh, little portions uh, to the developing world and not at all to sanctioned countries. Uh, and the second part is dealing strictly with sanctions as a weapon. So th today's uh, webinar, today's uh, really documentary is going to be available widely on YouTube uh, after we do this sort of launch premiere event today. And uh, it's another resource that can be used with the books and the downloadable material uh, and I really hope people plan their own events around the country, around the world. In other words, use this material as a resource, as a discussion, as educational material. And thank you very much to Suhin for making it. It follows the other things that he's done, as I say, as a Pacifica reporter, as a writer. I collaborated with him. He was a co-editor of the book, um, a capitalism on a ventilator, the impact of COVID-19 in China and the U.S. So, uh, Su Hin, I can't say enough about how important this documentary is and how having resources to challenge the sanctions as a weapon, how important that is for us uh, here in the U.S., how important it is around the world. Thank you for this documentary and um, for the help on the past books. And it's it's so interesting to be working actually with activists in China, helping to produce this, this documentary. It, it was Su Hin writing it, but he wasn't working alone. There's no product project that we take on just ourselves. We're always working with a whole group of people. And thank you, uh, Joe Lombardo for, uh, UNAC, United National Anti-War Coalition's role in producing uh, today's program for the Sanctions Kill campaign. So Suhin, let me turn this over to you to introduce the documentary and then we'll roll into uh, the film itself. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. 
Am I on the screen now? Yes, great, great, great. Uh, thank you for Sarah and Joe to invite me today uh, to join the, the webinar. I think so you're still on the screen, not me, but uh, you can, everyone can hear me, then I talk over uh, and uh, as Sarah said- You're, you're, this um, is, you're on the screen. Okay, good. And uh, so this is a, a joint effort between Chinese activists from China and American activists from the United States. And uh, this project won't happen unless like uh, activists like SAR founders uh, from International Action Center, uh, Joe Rabado from the United anti National Anti War uh, Coalitions, as well as uh, my friends in China, such as uh, Ai Sixiang, uh, that is another network who help us in China. So the whole idea we coming out, uh, make it simple was the, as an idea when the sanction book was completed, also Sarah founder invite me, uh, sanction kills campaign invite me to write a chapter. And then we do a book tour last December. And uh, I was uh, doing a solid work between US and China. And I was in China and tell the folks in uh, over there that we need to uh, bring a gift to American activists, US activists that uh, something can be educational material. So uh, a folks uh, who are professionally on the production air, uh, industry offer me pro bono to produce this documentary, unless they help me, this document won't be documentary won't be happen. It started on mid November last year. And within two weeks, we produced a first edition of 25 minutes. And then we expand the include the sanction part and then uh, complete the whole documentary on January. So just less than month uh, uh, a process to make this happen. Also, uh, and uh, gratefully that the uh, International Action Center has been uh, uh, help hosting us, helping us to organize uh, uh, the film screening event and discussion and everything. So this is a joint collaborated Effort. I'm just only one of the maybe a nuts and bolts and, and uh, on this process without everyone else, including friends in uh, uh, in New York City, offer me place to stay. Without that, that won't be happen. And uh, so this is uh, how to show that collaborations, international solidarity is more important than the hegemony, the racism, and the divisions. And, uh, at, and uh, after the, this is not only a documentary because I don't want to say I'm a director or producer because I'm a community activist. I'm still working on uh, working class work. And this is just an educational material. We want to become an educational tool to understand what is uh, uh, the sanctions means, what is a vaccine imperialism means, what is a better way to build an international cooperation and better future? And that is, I have a, uh, uh, we also have the educational material like books and DVDs, and then maybe we're going to uh, publish future uh, on, the, on the website, maybe people can buy it. So uh, without further delay, I think that we can start the documentary. Joe, back to you. Okay, I'm gonna start the documentary. If uh, people um, have a problem seeing it, uh, try to let me know as soon as you can, and um, let's see if we can get it going. Years ago. Um, Would anyone believe that a disease can kill over a million people in the United States and a few million more around the world? Three years ago. Would anyone believe that the United States COVID response can be a total failure and that the country would refuse to share their vaccines to developing countries around the world?
No, the sound went out. Joe? The sound is out. The real failures of our profit driven. The sound is out. Did you hear any sound? Just the opening line. And then when Margaret Flowers came on, it went silent. Really? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh okay. So, I know what the problem is. Okay. I'll tell you again. Okay, here we go. I'm going to come do it again. I know what the problem is. Okay, sorry. Flowers. I'm a pediatrician based in Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States. Margaret Flowers, director of Popular Resistance, has long been an activist for a national public health care system in the United States. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed in the United States the real failures of our profit-driven health care system and the inequalities that we experience here in the United States uh, because we didn't have any sort of national framework with which to organize a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. While the United States has one of the world's largest, most funded and supposedly most advanced healthcare system in the world, it nonetheless failed miserably in the fight against the COVID-19. But the past two years, you know, we've had everything closed down in New York and people have suffered tremendously. I've known people who've died. Most of the people who I've known who've died were people of color and some of the sickest people, some of our service workers, many nurses, I'm an old nurse and many of our nurses died of COVID and have people who they know who've died and were traumatized by the workloads they've had. I went back to work and it was really, really difficult. So between the patients I worked for and the people I knew personally, I guess it's about 20 or 30 people infected. Um, Hundreds, I think we really have a lot of people, including myself, people in New York are, are having the worst cases of COVID for the most part. Lee Su Hin, a Chinese American community organizer from Los Angeles, California, a former Pacifica Radio KPFK Los Angeles reporter and a longtime activist on immigrant workers' rights, peace, and social justice. Currently, he travels between China and the United States for binational activist solidarity movement and to build medical solidarity projects for the global south. The U.S. has accounted for one-sixth of recorded global cases and deaths with just 4% of the global population. Why is the American expressionism that arrogant U.S. government refused to work with international communities to collectively fight against the virus, even launching economic and medical sanctions against other countries. 当美国说所谓的中国病毒论这种方言在过去三年美国和西方国家其实他们就是正在向全世界散毒过毒包括这几年以来中美之间美国有很多回到中国的旅客到中国的旅客在机场新冠检测的时候发现阳性 so, from the beginning, this different approach of China in, a, in a, uh, conditions of quarantine with an unknown virus and how to coordinate the testing, how to utilize uh, masking and uh, emergency measures was completely different from the U.S. and also the European imperialist powers. Sarah Flounders. Hello, I'm Sarah Flounders, a political activist and organizer in the United States. I work with the International Action Center, the United National Anti-War Coalition. I'm a contributing editor to Workers' World newspaper, and I, I've been active for decades in people's struggles in the U.S. and against endless U.S. wars. At this point now, in the United States, there is a a complete ignoring of the impact of COVID. The message again and again is just go on with life. 
People are not wearing masks, even on public transportation, in large sports, concert and music gatherings. Uh, it's rare, it's rare to see people wearing masks or taking any precautions whatsoever. Now, why is this? According to US figures at this time, 93% of the deaths are in people over 50. This is a very expendable part of the population. The deaths are also among people with pre-existing conditions or that is considered a drain on the economy. Again, it's people who are expendable. So life is going on in the midst of COVID pandemic. Is the U.S. capitalist greed and COVID racism force more inner city poor people, color communities, and other people die from the pandemic? 疫苗帝国主义美国奉行的这个政策把全世界很急需的疫苗大量的采购大量的团击造成疫苗在南方国家不够买不到或者是就算想买也买不到很便宜的价钱 There were shortages throughout the country of basic supplies to protect our healthcare workers and uh, counties and states fighting with each other and making uh, deals you know, in secret to try to get the equipment that they needed to deal with the pandemic. For the long time in the United States, we have had, well, really from the beginning of the country, inequalities in the treatment of people based on their race and based on their income. And this has played out in a devastating way in the COVID-19 pandemic, where communities, black and brown communities, have really faced the brunt, and, and Native American and Alaskan communities have really faced the brunt of this pandemic. For a number of reasons. One reason is that there were barriers for getting vaccination and treatment. So people need access to the internet and really took quite a bit of time to make an appointment for vaccination. And this is something particularly difficult for people who have more than one job, who take care of their families, and who don't have easy and reliable access to the internet. They're not able to make appointments. But there was also a lot of mistrust in the healthcare system of the United States in general, because it is driven by profit and not by the needs of the people. This is particularly true for the black and the brown communities who have been historically discriminated against in our healthcare system and thus have an innate mistrust to the system. There was lots of misinformation going around about medications, about vaccinations, about how serious the pandemic was, and all of these create doubts and deteriorate the mistrust that people have in our healthcare system. Sadly, up till now, the white people are even more likely to die from the COVID than people of color. Because of the anti-vax movement, many white people refuse to be vaccinated. As a result, many vaccines have been wasted and not enough people take the jab. It's true that former President Donald Trump, responsible for most of the brain of the US COVID disaster. But be honest, President Biden also shared many blame as well. It's the fact that under his administration, more people infected and died from the COVID for the past two years. Here's the one head who spread the false endemic myth, lifting almost all COVID restrictions and taking away the pandemic emergency funds to support the U.S. NATO proxy war in Ukraine. So there was really no set system in the United States to give clear, accurate, timely information and to get the supplies, including vaccines, to the places where they were needed the most. In addition to that, black and brown communities struggled because they are, uh, there's a higher proportion of people in those communities who work in what are considered essential jobs, service jobs. And uh, so they continued working, but they didn't receive the materials that they needed or the education that they needed to protect themselves. Uh, I mean, there was 
there have been countless complaints filed with the Occupation Safety and Health Administration over a workplaces just not providing what the employees needed, forcing them to work in dangerous conditions, and so uh, resulting in more illnesses and outbreaks in the places of employment. Because of this, over the past two years in the United States, we have seen a real decline in life expectancy. In January 2020, several cases of viral pneumonia of unknown origin were detected in the central Chinese city of Wuhan. No one knew exactly what the virus was, hence the vague identifier of coronavirus so popularly known today. Thousands of miles away in the U.S., when the virus was believed not to have reached the soil yet, right-wing U.S. elites, media, and politicians began using callous words to ridicule China, calling the virus China's Chernobyl. U.S. Senator Tom Cotton famous for his anti-China rhetoric, along with the right-wing media and the liberal Washington Post, began expressing the Wuhan military lab-made virus conspiracy theory. China mobilized the national efforts to beat the odds and successfully contain the virus within three months. When the Wuhan lockdown was lifted on April the 8th, 2020, it marked the official end of the COVID-19 crisis in China. But no one would have predicted that the pandemic would spread rapidly to Europe or that the U.S. would become the COVID-19 epic center, hosting nearly a quarter of cases and deaths all over the globe. China's前景的成功的经验和美国的失败，表明中国的社会主义制度的成功在这方面的成功和美国资本产阶级制度的失败，因为他们不是以人为本。另外一个很关键的。就是表现出美国的自大和自私和短视，从左到右都是一样。他们情愿花更多的时间去搞这些所谓呃反华反共呃运动，而不把心思放在怎么跟其他国家合作，包括中国学习中国的成功的抗疫经验，去想办法在美
ahead and published it ourselves. We fought against the Amazon ban by firing appeal to their ban. But they are too arrogant to even talk to us seriously. We organized several press releases and webinars to denounce Amazon's ban on our book, but no U.S. media, not even left progressive media, cover our story. 其中有一家叫做Businesswire.com是美国最大的一个网络信息媒体推广的一个公关平台，但是当他看到我这个稿以后呢，不单只没有帮我们去推广，他立刻就把我的账号给封了，而且没有解释任何理由，知道吗？这
It has also exposed the destructive role of the United States in the world, its failure to cooperate with other countries, its protection of the profits of transnational corporations over the health of the people. You know, for here in the United States, the government invested billions of dollars into the research to develop the COVID-19 vaccines, but yet those pharmaceutical corporations that received that money are also profiting greatly off the sale of the vaccines. And when we look at how they um, negotiate prices with countries around the world, we see that for the poorer nations in the global south, they're being charged very high prices uh, to receive the vaccine, often forcing them into having to take out loans through the US dominated International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. This debt then causes greater harm to those countries as often uh, there are demands that the countries service that debt and make cuts to their own social infrastructure in order to have the money to pay off those debts. Uh, we see an incredible vaccine apartheid in the, you know, shortly after the vaccines, months after the vaccines were uh, developed and available, 10 of the wealthiest countries in the world were hoarding 75% of the vaccine stock. And we saw many countries, uh, particularly countries in Africa, where they were not able to vaccinate uh, people at all. Now the figures are well over a million deaths in the US. It's almost at 1.1 million deaths. When we compare that to China, it's such a fraction. Wealthy nations, are hoarding most vaccines and denying them to poor nations. It's the US, UK against Europe, rich people against poor people, white against people of color, a racist vaccine pyramid that wealthy Western whites are at the top of the food chain and the non-white poor developing countries are always at the bottom. So far, very few Western-made vaccines has been delivered to the global South. The terms vaccine imperialism and distribution racism are based on rich countries buying up most Western-made vaccines, far more than they need, leaving very few for developing countries. 怎么可以做得到一个公平的疫苗分配当98个相对比较富有的国家会成就疫苗分配公平 However, all the doesn't mean they have received the vaccines or even will receive them soon. At the February 19th United Nations meeting on COVID vaccines, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres sharply criticized the widely uneven and unfair distribution of COVID vaccines in which only 10 countries in the world, notably the US, Canada, and eight Western European countries have taken 75% of all vaccines doses, while 130 other countries have received not a single doses. 根据世贸组织2022年5月14号 and that's the vaccine nationalism, imperialism, and vaccine apartheid racism.
as of November 23rd, 2022, China has donated 328 million doses of vaccines and sold another 1.65 billion to other countries, making it the world's largest export country of vaccines that has contributed roughly one third of the global exports volume. According to the World Trade Organization data, in roughly the same period, the United States exported 968 million doses, that is, only half of the volume of China. Nonetheless, as for the U.S. State Department, the United States has donated more than twice the number of vaccines to the world than that of China. Two-thirds of the United States vaccine exports have been through donation. Sounds very generous. Well, in reality, it was for dumping vaccines near the expiring date. The World Health Organization has vehemently criticized rich countries for dumping near-expired COVID-19 vaccines to poor regions. A new report found that more than one-third of jabs donated around the world are yet to be administered, remain in storage, or have been wasted. According to the U.S. media, pharmacies and U.S. government discarded 82.1 million COVID vaccine doses from December 2000. 20 through mid-May 2022, just over 11% of the doses the federal government distributed, including up to 17 million doses wasted between February to May. Rich countries can waste lots of vaccines and poor countries has nothing. That's crazy. The COVID pandemic has exposed the failures of the United States domestic without inability to make sure that all people be protected and get the health care. Okay, stop right here. Yes. Great. And uh, Suhin, maybe, to, yeah, good, your camera. We yeah. just wanted to, uh, for a minute, because the, the this um, documentary is in two sections. The first half, we were dealing with the vaccines and the second part is dealing with sanctions as a policy. So, um, Suhin, I think you were going to say a few Yes. Uh, we want to uh, link the issue to uh, not only uh, some people may be uh, 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 only concerned one issue and then uh, not concerning a uh, worry about another issues. We want to make this is a thing globally at locally, because uh, uh, what happened to the COVID last three years and the vaccines are also affecting today's, what happened today's in domestically and global scales, ranging from economic crisis to the, what happened in Ukraine, the Ukraine, Russian Ukraine conflict. And even and, and to this moment, the US increased political blackmail against China. So all this are, are, are related. And I, that's all a reason we want to, uh, instead of uh, like a, just a simple uh, workshops, uh, we need to have a comprehensive analysis to how to link all these things together because vaccines, vaccines, imperialism, vaccine as a tool for sanctions, sanction and also sanctions uh, to affect the one third of the population around the world are all related. And we need to think something might be not affecting us at all, or something may be affecting you, but nothing to do with me. We should concern every issue together that we can work together. Like uh, on this document, second half part, we talk about, uh, we were had the uh, showing on the Hostess Community College on South Bronx of the New York City. They have a unique uh, issues they're facing, the cafeteria. Uh, so uh, on the documentary, we did not talk too much about cafeteria. Maybe uh, uh, Sarah can explain, but that is the specific issue have been affected since the COVID and now supposed to be the so-called endemic the econo econ uh, economic condition in that region, also the gentrification are uh, also hurting them. Maybe nothing to do with, no one, nothing to do with people outside New York City, but that is the issue. We need to be linking the struggle in what happened in the Palestine, 
struggle in the South Bronx, struggle uh, around, the, uh, in, around the world, link together to work together to find a common ground that can, we can fight against uh, the multinational corporate uh, uh, capitalism, the greedy capitalists, and the US and NATO Europe imperialisms. Sorry. Well, let's go back to the documentary. Uh, this, as as uh, Suhin was saying, the second part deals with sanctions as a policy imposed and the dangers, really the enormous hardship that creates for so many countries. And what is China's crime? What is China's crime is that it has not only refused to go along with the sanctions imposed on all these other countries, but is helping to create the trade, the currency exchanges. Uh, the, the sanctions on Russia have utterly failed to bring down Russia as the US promised it would, and instead have done great damage to the European Union's economy. Uh, now that actually benefits the US, and we should just be clear who benefits with the present threats on Taiwan. Uh, the US choice is war and sanctions, and we need a, a strong movement that understands this and begins to really resist uh, US wars. So let's go back to the documentary, and we do want to take uh, Q&A uh, at the end of this. So there's an, another about a half hour. Thank you. OK, we're going to go back now to the video. Um, getting there. Has also exposed the destructive role of the United States in the world, its failure to cooperate with other countries, and its protection of the profits of transnational corporations over the health of the people. But there is a more vicious role played by the United States in particular and the Western countries in general. They have been using sanctions as weapons against the world. We can also see that sanctions was used where the vaccines were weaponized. What countries could receive the small supply of vaccines that were being distributed was based totally on who was complicit with the United States. Countries that were sanctioned in every way were prevented from receiving vaccines or the basic essential supplies. So. Cuba could develop a vaccine, but the syringes in order to deliver it to their own population were in limited supply, and it was very difficult to get access. The United States was playing a destructive role during that time when the Secretary General of the United Nations was calling for an end to the U.S.'s illegal sanctions. The U.S. escalated those sanctions, continued to put new sanctions on, on countries. And so as a result of that, countries really struggled to be able to get the items that they needed in order to take care of their population. Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, and Afghan countries, the United States has a strict sanction for them. They have no access to any of there are always winners and losers for the sanctions, but no doubt, U.S. capitalists have been always the biggest winner from the sanctions. While the U.S. and the West are imposing unilateral sanctions against Russia after the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, banning all Russian oil sales, yet, according to the Indian press, U.S. is buying record amount of cheap Russian oil via India because a loophole in the sanction that do not apply to refine the products produced from cheaper Russian crude oil exported from third countries, because these products are not considered Russian in origin. The United States has continued pressuring other countries to comply with sanctions, yet the US itself is using its own designed loopholes to strengthen their selfish interests. The United States has been using the same dirty trick, using sanctions to force every country cannot buy for the sanctioned country, while U.S. itself buying goods from the country they sanctioned for discounted price. During the late 1990s, when the United Nations imposed sanctions by the demand of the United States and the West following Iraq invaded Kuwait 10 years earlier, 
Under the UN program, Iraq can only sell its oil to the international market with discounted price through the UN Oil for Food program. US, while officially imposing oil embargo against Iraq at that time, secretly buying large amount of Iraqi oil under the UN program with cheaper price. It sends a clear message to the world. The United States can use its military and political muscle to further its own economic interests. By undermining the international oil price, it sends an unquestionable message to the world. America is the only country that will decide who can produce, who can sell, and who can buy at what price. The brutal UN-US Western imposed Iraq sanctions had caused half a million Iraqi children died during the 1990s. When asked by the reporter during TV interview, then US Secretary of State Madeleine Albright spelled out the infamous, we think the price is worth it, quote. In the days since the pandemic has ebbed back in national attention, we have very consciously moved forward with a campaign against US use of sanctions. But even this has now changed globally. The war in the Ukraine, the brutal NATO expansion into the Ukraine, the arming and weaponizing of the people in Ukraine, the firing on the Russian population in Ukraine, all of this created a crisis that could not be avoided. According to Sanction Kills, an international campaign organized by many peace and justice organizations and activists, including Sarah Flanders, Margaret Flowers, and Lee Su Hyun, to criticize Western countries using sanctions as weapons against the world. Sanctions are essentially the imposition of arbitrary measures creating inhumane economic hardship on a targeted country. Sanctions from the United States affected a third of the world's population, imposing more than 8,000 measures on more than 40 countries. Economic sanctions are also known as embargoes. The U.S. effort to impose and to get all of the European Union and Britain to go along with the sanctions was to cut the trade relations with Russia. A very different thing happened, though, and that is the rest of the world refused to go along with U.S. sanctions because they were still able to trade with China and have economic relations and exchange. And so sanctions on Russia and now new, even extensive sanctions on China are not succeeding. The people of the world increasingly are deciding to do what is in their own interests. They have a population to feed and they need food, fertilizer, technology, and they can't get that from the West except by onerous conditions that are an assault on their sovereignty. So we have produced a, a new book, which is an anthology looking at the both difference that exists now and also looking at sanctions as a weapon that is used again and again against there's a whole study of the impact of U.S. and U.N. sanctions on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, on uh, Iran, on still today the continuing sanctions on Syria and so on. But the more than 40 countries is a real theme that we take. The number of countries that are impacted it, uh, affects a whole economy regionally. So we're trying to explain this to working people here, that these sanctions come back, they boomerang onto the economy here with increasing inflation, uh, recession that really people are coping with in the layoffs and in a, an intensely fragile economy. Sanctions, a wrecking ball in a global economy is a book with several dozen writers, include Sarah Frondos, Margaret Flowers, and me, comprehensive analysis against Western sanctions against other countries. The impact of sanctions on more than 40 developing and formerly colonized countries, countries one third of the world population, was barely discussed in mainstream media for decades. The book invited a dozen activists from the Americas, Asia, Middle East, and Africa to discuss the devastated impact of US sanctions on other regions. 
With Margaret Fowler's wrote Sanctions Kill Toolkit to understand the history of US sanctions and why we need to be against it. I think a necessity for the workers' movement in the US to explain to working people that racism, that bigotry, that attacks on another country are not in their own interests. And this really helps to combat also the anti-China sentiment that is being consciously whipped up every single day by the media. It's used to justify the new rounds of sanctions on China, whether it's in chips or uh, whether it is in cotton from Xinjiang. Every form of US policy is to intensify and to justify sanctions. And we feel that this has to be combated within the United States. This has to be explained again and again. Books are one way, the webinars are another, the demonstrations and rallies are still another, but it's important for working people to have their own voice in this and not only the voice of corporate power. On December, 2022, Sarah Flanders invited Lee Suhin to New York joining the Sanctions National Book Launching Tour. Community activists from four cities across the U.S. invited authors of the book, including Sarah Flanders, Lee Su Hin, and others, to speak at the local event. First stop is the Philadelphia. South Bronx, where Hostel's Community College located, is the poorest area in the New York City, has quickly gentrified by the real estate developers. Why do you have to pay for tuition? They don't in other countries. Why is there no money for this? And why three years without a cafeteria? And even then, shouldn't the food be free? Many countries, hardship has been related to the US imperialism, not only directly military intervention, covert actions, and also all this kind of regime change but simply also an embargo, a sanction that has been imposing to the country that created a huge economic impact and also kind of psychological warfare that making people have all this kind of social upheaval and then all this kind of different kind of the society crisis that forcing them to leave the country, they come in not only because of economic hardship, but also psychological warfare that people think U.S. is the best country in the world. As a Trump president, that China's U.S. trade war imposed by U.S. to China against China using different kind of dozen different, even hundreds different type of sanctions and model, even directly targeting a private company called Huawei, the high tech company, kidnapping the CFO of the Huawei in Canada, saying that he's just violated the Iran sanction act. Yes, then they can impose the long arm to anyone down to the knees to listen to, need to listen, otherwise you're going to suffer major consequences. That is a racism. That is an imperialism. That's making people of color in other parts of developing countries thinking like the white people of the U.S. is a superior. We are an all-volunteer effort. And in addition to the printed copy, where we can send you a link when you order the book to the EPUB version, so you can read it on an e-reader, computer, smartphone, and the digital uh, edition is particularly useful for reaching activists living outside the U.S. because printing books is pretty expensive and we can forward the EPUB file. We're really interested in providing tools for grassroots political activists who are fighting and mobilizing for change. And the sanctions really understand what a brutal weapon because it's a crisis that hits the most vulnerable. It creates millions of small personal crises essential medicines for diabetes, for high blood pressure, for small infections. A broken bone can be a death penalty. 
polluted, untreated water because there's no chlorine is deadly. In international law, the targeting of civilians is always and totally off limits, even in a shooting war in the midst of a war. And yet, U.S. imperialism has perfected this form of siege warfare that deliberately targets civilians and the most vulnerable civilians, the young, the old, the chronically sick, the poorest. The sanctions are racist. They overwhelmingly target people of color in the global south, and sanctions come back and hit us here. But the ability of the U.S. to enforce global domination is slipping. It's proof of its inability to enforce the devastating sanctions of thousands of new sanctions on Russia and on China. The global south, the countries of Africa, Latin America, most of the countries of Asia, the formerly colonized world are not complying with these thousands of sanctions imposed by the US and the European nations, the NATO members, the sanctions especially imposed on Russia. They need the grain, the energy, the resources, and the ability of the United States to create economic chaos has not succeeded. It is a shock the powers that be here. The increased sanctions on China have a destructive impact on science and technology on a global scale. The cooperation is expanding among these sanctioned countries. We can look at the BRICS plus new levels of cooperation and trade agreements, the Belt and Road, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Problems are solved by cooperation and not by endless war and sanctions. They're solved by respect for sovereignty and independence and respect for different development paths for multilateralism versus US hegemony. Now, where do we stand in all of this? Working people right here need their own voice. We can't be chained to the corporate media and the capitalist threats. There are new agreements this week with China and the Gulf states and all the Arab countries. There's excited talk of international currency involving yuan, ruble, and rupee. And all of this challenges the almighty U.S. dollar. So the world is changing rapidly. Earlier this month, the U.S., South Korea, and Japan imposed coordinated unilateral sanctions against North Korea after the U.S. failed to levy new international sanctions against North Korea also known by its official name, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or the DPRK. The U.S. has imposed these sanctions in response to North Korea's missile launch this past year. North Korea is being cast as a pariah state, but in reality, the North Korean development of nuclear weapons is a strategy of deterrence against U.S. imperial aggression. The U.S. has occupied and demonized Korea ever since it achieved its independence from Imperial Japan. During the Korean War, U.S. forces killed three to five million Koreans. This is a number that essentially amounts to genocide. The U.S. dropped more aerial bombs on North Korea than it did in the entire Pacific theater of World War II. And to this day, the Korean War is not over, thanks to U.S. interest in keeping Korea divided. The ceasefire signed in 1953 did not end the war. In fact, and while sanctions are just one part of the imperialist playbook, their effects can be devastating. One of the most sanctioned countries in the world, North Korea can't trade with other countries, receive international loans, or import fuel, or much of anything else. From agriculture to industry, sanctions impact all aspects of life in North Korea. Most things North Koreans need, they have to produce for themselves. There is no getting it from somewhere else. Sanctions impact water, sanitation, hygiene, and healthcare infrastructure. According to UNICEF, over 9.75 million people do not have access to safely managed drinking water. Crucially, one of the many types of items that North Korea is banned from importing due to sanctions is water sanitation equipment. Under sanctions, seeds, fertilizers, and agricultural equipment and other types of machinery are banned. And contrary to popular narratives that claim North Korea's government is intentionally withholding food from its population, 
Food insecurity in the country is driven by a lack of access to modern agricultural equipment and techniques, and is amplified by natural disasters and the impacts of climate change. The U.S. condemns human rights in North Korea, yet in the same breath, it violates those very rights by imposing deadly sanctions. The U.S. claims to want to end the Korean War, yet in the same breath, the U.S. imposes greater sanctions as an act of warfare, knowing full well that North Korea sees lifting sanctions as a precondition to negotiations to ending the war. We must not be fooled by the rhetoric of the United States, but look instead at its actions. And despite these repressive U.S. policies, North Korea has resisted sanctions and managed to hold its own and provide for its people. The North Korean people themselves continue to stay resilient and adapt to the many challenges they face through remarkable advancements in agriculture, energy, and textile and steel production. Sanctions will continue to serve as a major barrier to renewing peace talks between the two Koreas. We must organize against imperialist sanctions in order to achieve peace, liberation, and reunification in Korea. The People's Forum, one of the most famous progressive activist gathering place in the New York City, they have meeting rooms, library, coffee house, and book publisher. Next up, we're going to hear from about another country, resilient and determined, by Roger Wareham of the December 12th movement, who has organized solidarity with Zimbabwe under sanctions for decades. The largest number actually of sanctioned countries are African countries. It's a new colonialism. It's meant to divide and redivide, but particularly the campaign around Zimbabwe, I think stands out some of the strongest of the sanctions. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us to participate in this in this campaign. The campaign inviting us to participate in the campaign. So recently, particularly in the left, the sanctions on Zimbabwe were not really well known. And as Sarah was pointing out, uh, the U.S. rationale for imposing sanctions is that the the targeted country or the targeted people uh, pose a national threat to U.S. security or pose a threat to U.S. national security. The only threat that Zimbabwe uh, represented at the time the sanctions were imposed was that they really had the, the temerity and the audacity to just take their land back from the descendants of the settlers who stole it. That was it uh, until that time. If, if you look back at Zimbabwe's independence struggle and when they achieved independence in 1980, uh, there was a compromise that was reached. Um, they were about to win on the battlefield, but the South Africans who supported the Rhodesians had basically were saying that if the armed struggle didn't stop in Zimbabwe, they were going to continue to bomb civilians in the countries that had supported that struggle in Zambia, Tanzania. Uh, and so a uh, compromise was reached at Lancaster House in Great Britain in, in 1980. And part of that compromise was that there would be one man, one vote, majority rule, uh, but that for the first 10 years, the, uh, the representatives of the a white minority, and they were truly a minority in that, in that country, uh, would have a certain number of seats delegated in their legislature, in the parliament. And that... In that same period of time, there would be an, a, an agreement of one seller, one buyer, that the, uh, the whites who own the land would sell the land back to Zimbabweans, which is an interesting uh, concept that the thief would also be able to benefit from their thievery. That agreement was underwritten with the understanding that the money to pay the settlers would come from Great Britain and the United States for some reason, who knows what I mean. How the United States got involved in that, that's the old kith and kin uh, rap that they that they maintain to this day. So you rub my back, I'll rub your back. At that point in time, President Robert Mugabe, who had been portrayed in the Western press as the George Washington of his country, he was he was the he was a consummate Democrat. He was he was just he was the model that African leaders should model themselves after according to the West. At the point in time when Zimbabwe said, no, we're taking our land back, 
then he morphed from George Washington to Adolf Hitler. I mean, they, seriously, they began to portray him as the as the black Hitler, and they imposed the sanctions. And very interestingly, one of the one of the sponsors of the, of the resolution of the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act of 2001 was Hillary Clinton. Burning books, a famous local anarchist Marxist bookstore in Buffalo, New York, carry many activist books printed in the United States. They are harmful to the entire planet, and we're going to talk about how we can fight them because this isn't just informational, but we're going to talk about some of the ongoing campaigns that are actively fighting U.S. sanctions and imperialism around the world. And we're going to talk about why we as working class people here in the imperial floor should care about this. Haiti, Iran, Iraq, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Laos, Lebanon, Liberia, <laughs> Libya, Mali, Moldova, Montenegro, Myanmar, Nicaragua, Palestine, Paraguay, Russia, Serbia, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, Syria, Tunisia, Turkey, Uganda, and Venezuela. Today, December 10th, which is uh, celebrated around the world, if not in the U.S., as the International Human Rights Day. Um, ironic in the sense that what we are talking about and what we will further uh, explore is the uh, systematic attempt on the part of the U.S. settler colonial state to deny the most elementary uh, human rights to masses of people in this country and around the world. It's important to note that uh, the U.S. is the uh, leader of the Western Bloc, um, and its objective is to maintain the global hegemony of the uh, pan-European white supremacist colonial capitalist patriarchy that emerged uh, in 1492 and represents the, the hegemonic force that we are all struggling against today. In order to maintain that hegemony, they have decided that they are going to engage in open forms of, of war, warfare. And it's important to note that this sanction uh, weapon is in fact uh, a weapon of war. It has uh, devastating consequences for societies uh, throughout the, the, the world. Um, and it results in death and destruction in a real way. Since February this year, the imperialist powers of the US, Canada, the European Union, and Britain have imposed massive, unprecedented, unilateral, and illegal sanctions against Russia. These sanctions are very wide ranging. Russia has been cut out of SWIFT, which is the global messaging network for international payments, in order to try and cripple the Russian economy. Russian banks have had their assets frozen, over a trillion dollars worth of assets. Biden ordered a ban on Russian energy imports to the US. Easy enough for him to do, given that the US was importing precious little Russian energy in the first place. But the story in Europe is much more complicated. Germany, for example, has been reliant on Russian energy for more than 50 years. It's kind of interesting to observe here that no countries whatsoever were sanctioned as a result of the West's genocidal wars on Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya or Yugoslavia. You know, there's this liberal narrative going around that, well, Russia's invaded another country and you know, we've got to do something and therefore sanctions are justified. Even if you accept that argument, and obviously you shouldn't, you should at least ask why these rules don't apply when it's the US and its allies that are doing the invading. You know, the corner of Biden's foreign policy has been to essentially recreate the Cold War alliance, you know, when the freedom-loving West united under U.S. leadership against the evil commies of the East. And now Biden is looking to get the band back together to revive that same project, a hybrid war against socialism, against sovereignty, and against multipolarity. It's a manifestation of the project for a new American century. Now, that was a neocon project, uh, a neocon concept, a Rumsfeld, Cheney, Wolfowitz concept, but it's been taken up by successive Democratic and Republican administrations. As far as foreign policy is concerned, 
there's only one party, the war party. Today, I want to talk about the effects of U.S. sanctions or unilateral coercive measures on the developing nations in the Middle East. The group of countries we're going to talk about, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and critically, Palestine, can be referred to as the axis of resistance. They are the axis of resistance to the Israeli occupation of Palestine and to Western imperialism. In 2006, U.S. sanctions banned companies from doing business with the Palestinian Authority. Public schools and hospitals, along with other government services, were targeted by these sanctions. Meanwhile, individual members of the PA were enriched under the table, so they will enforce the Israeli and U.S. policies. Today, following a fierce 10-year proxy war, Syria has one-third of its territory occupied by the U.S. and its allies. Turkish-backed terrorists continue to control Syria's Idlib province, while Israel has annexed the Golan and routinely bombs Syrian territory from there. A proxy force led by the U.S. allied Kurds administers an area in the northeast of the country, which includes most of Syria's oil wells, their wheat producing region, and a significant water source, the Euphrates. The area is protected by approximately a thousand U.S. soldiers. With the country devastated by bombing raids and terrorist attacks, the U.S. placed new sanctions on Syria. These sanctions, ironically defined by the U.S. Caesar Civilian Protection Act, include what are called secondary sanctions, which punish any country or business that provides any support to the primary sanctioned country. Meanwhile, the Caesar sanctions are specifically tailored to prohibit reconstruction in Syria. They have not only destroyed the Syrian economy, but in conjunction with the theft of Syrian oil and wheat resources, they have devastated the population. Due to the secondary sanctions, international companies are afraid to provide any resources due to the fear of U.S. retaliation. Since Syrian banking and much of their import-export business was either directly with Lebanon or processed through Lebanese banks, the secondary sanctions on Syria brought down the already fragile and corrupt economy of Lebanon as well. And with the collapse of the banks in Lebanon, the equally unstable and corrupt government has collapsed as well. Elena Duhan, the United Nations Rapporteur on Secondary Sanctions, recently visited Syria. On her re return, she demanded that the sanctions on Syria be lifted immediately. Now, globally, the United States is trying desperately to hold on to its its domination of the world. And that's not, it's failing. It's not going to succeed because the world has seen and knows that the United States is not a reliable partner, is not an honest partner, will always put the profits of the corporations over the lives of its own people and people anywhere in the world. And the United States is harming itself by not cooperating with China and learning from the actions that China has taken over the past 70 years. Uh, the United States needs to let go of this hubris, of this American exceptionalism, and recognize that we have a lot to learn from people all around the world, and that it's necessary for our future that we become a nation of cooperation, of solidarity, of one that values human life and protection of the planet. The United States' future depends upon this change. In contrast to the sanctions and vaccine imperialism of the United States against the world, China has launched successful vaccine diplomacy to support the world. Also, China supports global economic developments by encouraging more international economic cooperation. Last November, China organized the fifth China International Import Expo to encourage more global imports. Especially imports from the global south. 
，中国非常慷慨，派他们的大门邀请全世界。甚至包括许多目前对中国实施无数制裁的国家的公司，也被允许来销售他们的产品。And sanctions now. Let's end sanctions and nurture our global communities. Sanctions now. Stop the sanctions. I'm Dean Knight, speaking from New York. I want to congratulate China on successfully overcoming COVID, even though it's important to know it's not over. Uh, and we know you can do it. That's the most amazing thing. You're a success in overcoming the pandemic. Let me read a chapter I wrote from the capitalism on a ventilator. It's no secret that domestically, police brutality and the war on terror is in fact just more oppression for black and immigrant communities. That won't be help justice in the US unless there's a people's revolution for fundamental social change that demand the moving of money and wealth from the richest 1% and the war back to the working class, people of color, immigrants and indigenous people. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. I hope Thank you, you. Thank enjoyed you. that. I'm I'm gonna just quickly put up a um a where you could get the the books uh, uh, that were mentioned here. So just hang on for one second, and I will share that screen with you. Um, if I find it, uh, <laughs> I I also put it in the chat. So okay. Can see it there. Oh, that's the wrong one. Oops. Uh, all right. So let's see what happened now. All right. I'm probably not going to get it up, sir. Put it in the chat. Uh, and um, you could take a look at that. Um, we'll see if there's any questions. I hope you found the um, video documentary interesting and a useful tool. Uh, if you registered for this webinar, Tomorrow, about this time, you'll get a message from Zoom. Don't just throw it away because in there, there'll be um, the uh, URL for the video itself that you could see and also for this webinar in case you want to hear what people uh, commented. So both will be in there and you can um, share that and I hope you will. Let's see if we got any questions. Um, uh Yes. Yeah, I see that's many questions. There, there are lots of questions, and, and we can't deal with all of them. And some of them were written as the film was going on and then were kind of answered by the film. So um, that that's part of it also. Uh, now, one person was asking that we name the African countries uh, sanctioned. And uh, just to say, in, in the opening page of the sanctions book is a list of all 40 countries, and also it's read by one of the folks on the list, the number, but the largest number of countries are African countries, uh, and it's the countries, the most um, dependent, formally colonized countries that overwhelmingly are sanctioned, and, and that's important just to, to recognize that whether it's Central Africa Republic or Congo DRC, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Tunisia, Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, and I'm, I'm probably leaving out 
some uh, countries here, Libya, of course, um, it really shows uh, a, a criminal effort. So just to ad address that, it's important to know how many countries, when we say 40 countries, none of them the countries that actually, the imperialist countries that make the wars around the world are among the sanctioned. There were uh, questions on the names of some of the China vaccines. And some of these questions, uh, Suhin may want to particularly um, address. But yes, several, several countries, of course, China developed its own vaccines. I think there were more than five that were commercially produced that passed every level of inspection. Russia produced the Sputnik vaccine. Uh, Iran produced the Covaran vaccine. Um, and as we raised in the film, Cuba produced uh, very quickly a vaccine, but literally lacked the syringes to distribute it to their own population. And this was a, an entire campaign in the US. So it, it shows the une inequality uh, and just before I, I turn this over, one important point I want to always raise about Cuba, who provides more doctors, medical technicians in Africa and in the Caribbean than the World Health Organization. Uh, small country, and yet able to do so much. Uh, it's, it's always important to talk about what's possible. China's very large. And, and was able to develop millions of vaccines. But what they also did was they created an entire medical lab in China for Cuban specialists to produce uh, vaccines on a global scale. That shows the kind of cooperation that countries need to be considering. Uh, but Suhin, please, you, you take- Yes, that. yes, uh, thank you, uh, Sarah and Joel. Uh, I'm going through the, some questions without repeating what Aunt uh, Star just said uh, as something new. So uh, yes, the, it's on the YouTube, and but also we uh, uh, this is educational materials, and uh, we in, and uh, we intend to make it. This is a different chapter. If you if people have chance to uh, see it again or can understand that actually have a seven chapters on this documentary. We broke all these seven chapters into the YouTube as well. And uh, so uh, pandemic and capitalism ventilator sanction kills campaign. So uh, uh, we designed this as, as an educational material chapter by chapter on different topics. And that is also a good tool. Uh, and then with discussion materials and also the readers, uh, basically a transcript of this documentary, you can download, uh, maybe uh, we, can, uh, we can send you the link later or maybe purchase the book we uh, published with uh, Chinese, English and Spanish editions. So uh, all this is uh, we intend to do a educational material with uh, a chapter to chapter on different topics for uh, offline discussion. So that's what, uh, what we are also uh, aiming to do. And uh, other questions about the vaccine is very interesting because uh, uh, and, uh, US has vaccines that primarily have been uh, pushing for, but I want to say, I mean, China has five vaccines, which is Sarah said, but also I want to push one very important point is, uh, U.S. has been pushing very uh, uh, so-called the most advanced vaccines, the the mRNA vaccines, uh, like Pfizer and Moderna, and however, there's a, there's a, but the China did not go to that route. There are more traditional vaccines that can be easy to produce, easy to store and easy to, uh, and uh, that's uh, have been known proof that the more stable and more uh, 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 useful for uh, mass uh, uh, vaccinations. That what has been, so you think about this is uh, like a US is producing very expensive deluxe uh, vaccines while China has been focusing on affordable, more easy to distribute uh, vaccines to not only to the people, but also around the world. So that's reason at the end, the outcome 
of vaccinations and the effectiveness and also how many vaccines develop, uh, develop, uh, 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 sent uh, to distribute around the world are, are completely different. It's uh, what one is a uh, uh, capitalist greed uh, want to say they have the, uh, just like what they always are US imperialism or even some kind of like a uh, mindset that's saying that the US are the best product so they not producing something that's simple but also control the market because something China can do well well US do not want to join with China to do to help spread uh, to do a better vaccine distributions to the world instead they develop something that said they claim to be the best and uh, and then they want to control the market. So that is the, how the capitalism works. It's not going to be a humanitarian. It's not going to be the uh, how to uh, to think about what would the best way, uh, best outcome. Instead, the bottom lines, instead the stock values, and instead the, what, how much money they can get at the end at their bank account. So that is the difference. And what a sanction is a that definitely is a devastate that I want to make sure I have everything I've been answered uh, uh, going too fast. Uh, and sanctions are designed to, uh, uh, the sanctions around the world, it's even a uh, uh, different country, different sanctions. But what the, the devastating impact on the sanction on the US is the, the, the in deliberately targeting the vulnerable people, as uh, uh, Sarah said, they are uh, directly targeting the people uh, colored the poor, the sick, and all this. And uh, so that making even worse. So the, right now, the, what the US sanction against China is slightly different because of what they can use this the same type of sanction to the poor, small development country won't work in China. That's a how shock and, uh, and also frustrated the US policy makers, the neocon, the traditional sanction doesn't work in China as well as in the Russia. That's the reason uh, uh, also uh, many country also rely on technology from China, the products from China, the food from Russia, the oil from Russia. They do not want, they do not want to comply with US sanctions and Western sanctions because they affect the country because at the end who benefit is the US imperialists and corporate Americans. And uh, uh, last thing I want to say is uh, the international corp and, and linking the uh, global issues are very important. This is an ongoing educational campaign, not just only a documentary. That's the least I don't want people thinking I'm a documentary, so I'm a producer, a community activist. I'm also uh, just a community educator, curator. And, uh, the, the sanction books, the good news, uh, uh, is going to be published, uh, translated and published in China, Chinese edition, very soon. And thank, thanks for the uh, effort uh, uh, my, uh, and China also interest on this issue. And another thing is that also the, the we're continuing doing campaigns. I don't know if Joel can uh, able to show the, the light show we done last week in the UN and the US mission that also will continue uh, efforts. Let me just say a couple of things, if I can. Uh, first of all, the chat is back on if people want to use that. And I put in the chat, you might have to scroll up a little bit, the where you can get the book, the books, actually, that the two books that were mentioned. Um, and um, also, uh, I put the link to the video that you just saw. And as I said before, 24 hours from now, you'll get a message from Zoom if you registered that will um, have the link to the video and it will also have the link to this webinar, which includes the video. So you could see that there. Now, uh, Suhin just mentioned that um, we're doing other campaigns. Of course we are. And uh, he mentioned something we did in, in New York just recently where we um, were gifted a great piece of equipment which allows us to project large messages onto buildings. So when the uh, so-called president of Taiwan was here, um, we went to her hotel and we projected on that hotel uh, the message that said, no war with China, no arms to Taiwan. We also then went to the United Nations and to the US Embassy to the United Nations, which is right across the street. 
and projected messages such as uh, end all sanctions, no to war, um, and a number of other uh, messages, no arms to Ukraine, et cetera. So um, uh, we'll be using that more in the future and um, uh, hopefully it can be a tool for our entire uh, movement, but um, uh, this the uh, the, the um, campaign around sanctions is one of many um, campaigns that we're involved in now. I would urge you to go to the UNAC website, unacpeace.org, and take a look at some of the things that we're involved in. And many of the people you you saw speak here are members of UNAC. I think they all are, and uh, members of the UNAC Administrative Committee. So. More questions, more answers? I'll, I'll deal with a few things that have come up. Um, there was a, a question uh, uh, from Ann Garrison about uh, did China produce um, the mRNA vaccines, which is what the U.S. produced, who uh, vaccines that had to be kept super cold uh, well below freezing and uh, have very complex and expensive shipping and distribution requirements. Uh, and China has produced one of those vaccines, but overwhelmingly, uh, as Su Hin was saying, China, also Cuba, Iran, Russia, a number of countries, but particularly China in large quantities, produce the much simpler, older form of, of producing vaccines. Uh, which is really from the uh, infection itself when it has been deactivated. I'm, I'm not a scientist at all. I'm not giving an explanation of that that's very good, but um, there were easy solutions that could have been mass distributed around the world. And instead, the pharmaceutical industry of the US is totally oriented to immediate profit. And while the US was willing to pay for vaccines here, they were charged enormous amounts for every jab, for every shot. Um, and yet around the world, hardly given out at all. So that's why we say vaccine imperialism. It's really putting the profit system first, the needs of working people here and, and around the world for sure uh, are come last, come, aren't re really even part of the calculation. There are simple solutions for many of the world's problems. And we want to really put that forward again and again in what we're doing. Uh, that's the purpose of the books and the material. And, and as Joe was saying, even the light show, what are the things that we can do from the grassroots uh, actively and with large numbers of people? So do take down um, the YouTube links that we're going to have up. There's one version that is in English and Spanish subtitles. Uh, although Suhin is still speaking in Chinese in some of the um, uh, frames, uh, but it has English and Spanish subtitles, and then the others have uh, English and Chinese subtitles. So you can take it down in several forms along with uh, this, this version also will be up on YouTube. So we'll be getting that out, um, uh, you know, in, in many different ways. It shows there's simple ways of doing things, whether it's vaccines or it's uh, videos, films, light shows, demonstrations, uh, and actions. We, we got to really think collectively uh, on, on every step of this. Uh, it's, it's a very dangerous, we're in a very dangerous moment in history, and we got to be really clear on that, that the threat of war, expanding wars, is really growing quickly. We can see that if you're following developments in Taiwan, or if you're following leaks going on um, of, of U.S. war plans, Ukraine to Taiwan to Korea, so... Let's stay in touch with each other and- uh, Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to add two, two things that you just said that's very interesting. I want to uh, reiterate uh, two things. Uh, when you said I was talking uh, Chinese on the documentary because uh, I, 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 
the reason uh, I want to, uh, I was uh, talk, uh, I doing bilingual in the documentaries because two very, two very important, three very important reasons. Uh, I can speak whole uh, entire documentary in English without even one word of Chinese, uh, but I constantly uh, this decided decision that I, this is a joint China-US production because many countries around the world, even when I did this documentary in China, they said this is US production. I want to let people know this is not a made in the USA US production. This is a Chinese production. It's joint China-US production. I need to be specific. And other things that uh, I was, uh, people were being said because I live in um, US, so I'm a privileged uh, some kind of privileged Chinese. I am not. I was a former undocumented sweatshop worker from a un from uh, uh, from downtown Los Angeles. This entire documentary was made almost zero budget. Basically, people in kind donation to support. Uh, that's the reason uh, I uh, I decide consciously decided that I need to uh, also uh, 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 some some part I need to start talking Chinese and also talking English that prove that I can speak Chinese because many people, uh, many times on documentary, they just are uh, making sounds like this is a, a, a Chinese production, but that doesn't speak Chinese. I want to be, this is a joint production. This is made in China, also joint China US productions and, and the solidarity in both countries. But also one more message I want to tell you because I would also in, invite a few more people want in China or in the Chinese American community to come to speak on this documentary, but they were too afraid to speak in front of the camera. And uh, mostly because they're afraid of the US sanctions. And uh, they do not want to be future that they can target by the US uh, uh, government or FBI or et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so they refuse to want to, uh, they refuse to talk. But I need to talk in front of the camera and then I need to let people know who I am to let people know that this, we need to fight against the, not only the US, uh, 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 the US imperialism, not only fight against the US sanctions, but also fight against the US censorship. That is a very important. That's the reason I've been putting effort uh, to talk uh, uh, to make this is uh, uh, bilingual and, and then also uh, at one point I talk Chinese, one point I talk English and continuously mention this is joint China US productions. Thank you. Such a good explanation. Right. Thank you. Uh, well, we've been going for almost two hours. Um, so I, I think we should stop here. Um, yeah. Again, you can get more information about Sanctions Kill by going to sanctionskill.org. Um, and I think actually there's a PDF of some of these books there that you might be able to download. Um, yeah. I'm sure like this that. one, and then I can yeah. download online. Yeah. And but you uh, can also get um, um, Margaret Flowers' uh, um, uh, slideshow that she did on sanctions, which is a very important tool that all of us could use. You can also go to the UNAC website, which is unacpeace.org, to find out about this. Camp sanctions kill all the campaigns we're involved in and this video will also be up on there um, soon so i want to thank everybody for coming and staying for this um, entire presentation which i think is very important let's all do what we can to get it out um, let's try to break through this uh, media block out uh, block out that um uh, we see in this country where there's so much censorship and so much propaganda right now. Let's let the truth out a little bit. And this is sharing this is one way that you can. So thanks to Sue Hin Lee and uh, thanks to Sarah Flounders and um, all of you for joining us. And we, we, will send, so we will send everyone who registered the links for the, on, on YouTube for the film and uh, the information on how to uh, get the books and, and all of that. So look for that in your email. If you registered, even for those who didn't get a chance to come on the call, they can that way see it later. And it's how we spread all this information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Take bye care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.